So ladies and gen gentlemen, Jason Johns. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to acknowledge my reptilian ancestors who contributed the part of my brain that told me there was something terribly wrong yesterday when I opened the paper before I even realised what it was. And my mammalian ancestors who gave me a flood of emotions but also the hormones to cope with them as it started to unfold. I'd like to thank my human ancestors who reassured me that the world wasn't ending, it wasn't that bad. The dilemma, the crisis that I refer to is that when I read the story about the TEDx talks and what I was going to be talking about, it was completely different from the talk I've been practicing for the last <laughs> month and the one that's on your schedule. <coughs> I'd like to acknowledge the spirit who, I believe, then said to me, the problem isn't the journalist, she actually got the title right, you've just been giving the wrong talk. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge all of the people, human and others, that I have known over the last 40 years that have given me some resources to draw on now to share with you the talk I'm going to give you instead. <laughs> and if any of you were working in Australia enough that you actually paid some taxes a few years ago, I'd like to thank you for contributing to this rather oversized book, which was my PhD thesis, called Biocentric Theology, Christianity Celebrating Humans as a Temporary and Tiny Part of the Story of God and Life not the centre of it. Yeah. Listen to this. I'm not going to read it for you, but I was asked as I was trying to write it and sleep deprived, trying to uh, help Tony raise our first child, to give a 45 second talk on my thesis and what my hopes were for the future of the Uniting Church based on it. Making 12 minutes seem very generous. Thank you, Justin. This is what I said roughly. My hope for the Uniting Church, and indeed for the whole church, for all religions, and really for all humans, is that we will become a biocentric faith community, a life-centered faith community. One that really understands that the story of God and the universe is a story about God and the whole of life, not one that's centered on human beings. That we'll come not just to think like a mountain, as the deep ecologists encourage us to, but to think like the God who was here before the mountains even existed who on this very planet for billions of years enjoyed a relationship with all kinds of creatures before human beings appeared on the scene. And that with this much more humble view of our place in the life on earth and in God's heart, we will be compelled to make room on this planet for all of the other creatures out there so that they can continue to enjoy the relationship with God that God desires. That's my hope for the future of the church. How hopeful am I that that's actually going to happen? Well, not so hopeful really, I suppose. The church takes a very long time to talk about things. Any big group of people takes a long time to change its mind on something and then to actually do something about that. We've had well over 250 years now to grapple with uh, the thoughts that were gelled by Charles Darwin and we're making very slow progress. <laughs> It's taken a centuries though to talk about allowing women into leadership and finally some small parts of the church have done it but many still haven't managed. So I don't have a lot of hope that the church is likely to embrace biocentrism anytime soon. However, the last part of my hope that we might be compelled to create room on this planet for all of the other creatures so that they can enjoy the relationship with God that God desires, I'm a little bit more hopeful about that. Ironically enough, it's actually the theory of evolution that compels me to have a little bit of hope about that and to realise that it doesn't actually matter if the church doesn't embrace biocentrism or any other religions or any of you out there too much. Evolution doesn't work with the perfect, it doesn't aim for some future goal, it takes what it's got, picks out the bits that are necessary to form a new generation so that life can continue. So what have we got when we're looking at Christianity and our relationship with the planet? Ironically, evolution leads me to think that creationism is actually fine and dandy and will do very well, thank you very much. In Australia, about 30% of Christians believe that the uh, way the story of life is told in the uh, Bible, in Genesis, is literally historically true. Probably about 60% of us say we believe in the theory of evolution but have done very little to actually integrate that into our theology and our understanding of God and life. So effectively we're kind of creationists theologically even if we think Adam and Eve were metaphorical and not literal. 
What do we need to select out of that to have any hope of creating space for other creatures on the planet? Because we don't have another 250 years to talk about it. We don't even have 25 years to talk about it. As you've heard today, if we've got 10 years to talk about it, we're really lucky. And of course, looking around the rest of the world, we realise we should have been dealing with this a long time ago. What is it that we can pluck out of the story of creation that so many people say they believe and use to create space for other species on Earth? It's not just a bit of it, it's the core of it. Genesis 2 is a story where God creates this incredible garden and then out of the humus draws a human. Out of the Adam R draws an Adam. The Adam, the human, is given one really simple job to serve and to protect that garden. That, according to a literal reading of the Jewish and Christian and Islamic scriptures, is the purpose of humanity, to serve and to protect God's garden. What would happen if everybody that says they are a literal Christian or Jew or Islamic person got up every morning, got down on their knees and said to God, God, what am I going to do today to serve and protect the garden? How am I going to use my resources? Who am I going to talk to? How am I going to educate my children so that they are all aimed towards the one aim of serving and protecting this garden planet? It wouldn't matter if they didn't believe in evolution. It wouldn't matter if they thought evolution was just wrong or a tool of the devil and that people like me are agents of Satan for talking to you about it. As long as they got up every morning and asked, how do I serve and protect this planet, most of the creatures on this earth would be much happier than they are now. But creation is good enough to uh, lead people to have a much better relationship with life on earth. It's not so great for the rest of humanity, though. A literal understanding of our creation continues to perpetuate a whole lot of unnecessary suffering and negative uh, understandings of humanity and what it means to be a human being. Evolution, the true story of our origins, liberates us from a whole lot of baggage. We don't need to be an evolutionist to be liberated from this baggage because I believe the spirit brings forth truth in all kinds of ways, but evolution gives us a solid foundation for it. It uncovers the true sources of evil, not as some external personified force that's out to get us, but as some of the complications of living with this brain that started as reptilian and added some mammalian bits and some human bits and developed mostly in a Pleistocene era, era where we lived in small communities, travelled around constantly and had no possessions to worry about. If any of you are living in that kind of environment now, your brain is probably doing an ace job of helping you get through the day. If you're not, then we struggle and sometimes we do things that we'd call evil. It crushes the theology which excludes women from leadership, which is based on this ridiculous idea that because Eve took the fruit first and then persuaded the man to do something stupid as well, women can't be trusted to teach men. And that is the, that is the basis of the argument. A theology of sexuality and relationships is never going to get anywhere in the churches until we understand that sexuality existed long before human beings did, that most sexual reproduction on this planet has actually been same-sex, Heterosexuality is only a fairly recent innovation and sexuality and relationships constantly evolve to suit the environments we live in. So the question isn't what does Genesis say about sex, but what does it mean to be a person of faith trying to live as a sexual being in the 21st century? Evolution also liberates us, as we heard earlier today, to have a much better understanding of human diversity, which we've often labelled as disability, not as a result of some fall from perfection, but as part of the core of what it means to create life and human beings through mutation and evolution. It liberates us from the idea that human history is basically the same as Earth history, that the whole story is about us. Now that sounds good, it's nice to think the whole story is about us, but it also means everything's our fault. According to a traditional theology, everything bad in the world is because of you and your ancestors. Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they stuffed everything up, pain and death and all that bad stuff came into the world because of human beings. No wonder we're so pathetic and helpless that we'll never be able to do anything good and we have to sit around waiting for God to come down and fix it. The story of evolution makes it perfectly obvious that pain and death and mutation were here long before human beings. They're actually part of the process that created it. While my own personal death is a terrible tragedy that I hope people will mourn for a long time, <laughs> the death of your ancestors is actually fantastic because that's what made it possible for me to be here today. Death is not a bad thing and Christians need to get our head around that. A big part of the story then, and as do uh, industrialists and a whole bunch of other people, 
A big part of the way Christianity has been explained, even though it has little to do with Christianity or Jesus' teachings, is that the first Adam messed everything up with the help of his partner, and we've had to wait around until the second Adam, Jesus, came along some three or four thousand years later and fixed everything up. Any day now, he's going to come back and really, really fix everything up. And in the meantime, we just need to believe that that is going to happen and wait. As I said in the talk I was going to give, you can get away with thinking someone's coming back any day now for a few years and maybe even for a couple of decades, but it really is time that we left that hope behind. Human beings are not a helpless creature that ruined God's entire planet and now have to wait for God to come back and fix it up. We're meant to be part of the solution. Jesus isn't the second Adam, the Mr. Fix-It. So who is he? Well, dare I say you should read that book down there like the other two people who have read it <laughs> and you know the answer. But the great danger is that we love to talk about who Jesus was and how he relates to God exactly and use words like Trinity and co-eternal and so on because it's a fantastic distraction for rich Christians to get away from engaging with what Jesus actually said and expected us to do about it. It's kind of a parallel with what's going on at the moment. Climate change is this big thing out there and uh, rich people love to distract themselves from actually engaging with the new canon being written by the IPCC and instead to argue about the finer points of interpretation and detail. And rich people are really, 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 really good at distracting themselves from dealing with the obvious and straightforward stuff, which basically would say, whether you're an IPCC scientist or Jesus, that you have to start shedding a whole bunch of resources if you're wanting to survive into the future. A fair future for everyone. So my hope for the future, it's not really a biocentric Christianity. I don't imagine that's likely to happen, even though it should, because I'm right. <laughs> my hope is, though, that we can... Hey, I just heard a talk that said, like, oh, I'm awesome and individual and unique. <laughs> My hope is, though, that we can be driven to create this planet where all of the rest of life gets to have this relationship with God that God desires. And that would be good enough. I wouldn't even care if it turns out that evolution is completely wrong and creationism is right. My hope, my one enduring hope, is that when our species' time comes, when we're all dead and gone, and facing our Creator and God is considering how our relationship with this planet has gone, in the language of the creationists, God is able to turn to us in terms of our life here in the garden and say, well done, good and faithful servant. That'd be enough. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.